Coming up on DTNS, Allison Sheridan plays Rate the Apple Rumor. Amazon promises to pay you up to $1,000 for defective products from third parties. And Xiaomi gets into the robot dog race against Boston Dynamics. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 10th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from the Podfeet Podcast, I'm Allison Sheridan. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Sarah Lane has the day off, uh, but if you were listening to us on Good Day Internet, uh, you uh, heard us talking about solar power and batteries and why you can't get them in Alaska. But uh, Allison getting her new solar panels. Uh, get that wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Alexander Nesev, Hector Bones, and Tim Ashman. Thanks to you and everybody who supports us. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. TCL will release updated versions of its five and six series TVs with the same software running on Google's 2020 Chromecast. <gasps> TCL says, don't worry, we're not transitioning to Google TV off of Roku OS. It just wants to offer consumers the choice of both. The TCL six series with Google TV will be capable of 4K at 120 hertz, a uh, plus for if you've got a PS5 and or Xbox, and also comes with two HDMI 2.1 ports, one of which is eARC, and two additional HDMI 2.0 ports, topping out at 1300 bucks. TCL's Google TVs will also come with an always listening microphone for Google Assistant voice commands, but you do have the ability to disable that if you would rather just use the remote. Well, Venmo is rolling out a new option to allow users to buy cryptocurrency using the cash back they earn from their Venmo credit card purchases without transaction fees. Crypto options include Bitcoin, Ethereum, Light, uh, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash through the new cash back to crypto option. Speaking of cryptocurrency, CNN reports that AMC announced it will accept Bitcoin for tickets and snacks at all U.S. theaters by the end of 2021. AMC didn't specify how, but did say its theaters will also support Apple Pay and Google Pay for online purchases by the end of the year. Uh -huh. Google made a few privacy and security announcements. YouTube accounts identified as belonging to those aged 13 to 17 will have autoplay turned off by default and video uploads defaulting to private. Users 18 years old and younger can ask Google to remove pictures of themselves from Google image search and child accounts will not be able to enable location history. For children of all ages, Google simplified its Titan security key lineup to a $30 USB-A key and a $35 USB-C key both of which have NFC. And the Google One VPN is now, uh, which comes as part of a Google One subscription, is now available on Android in Mexico, Canada, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. Okay, how many of you immediately thought, I'm going to change my age to 14 to get these Google advantages? <laughs> I, I think when you request an image removal, they'll know. Oh, darn it. At DEF CON, Twitter revealed the results of its algorithmic bug bounty to find issues with its image cropping model. The top entry demonstrated the algorithm pre prefers slim, young, of light or warm skin color and smooth skin texture and with stereotypically feminine facial traits. The second place entry found a bias against people with white or gray hair, while the third place entry found it favored English over Arabic script in images. And Samsung announced a new wearable system on a chip, the Exynos W920, offering two Cortex A55 cores and a Mali G68 GPU, as well as a dedicated Cortex M55 processor for powering always on displays. Samsung claims it'll get 20% better CPU performance out of this new chip and 10 times better GPU performance than its previous wearable system on a chip. The Exynos W920 will support the new unified wearable platform coming from Samsung and Google. All right, let's talk about some new HP Chrome OS products for consumers. There's a 23.8 inch USB-C monitor as certified for Google use with Chromebooks. Google has a program that says, yep, yep, this will work great with Chrome OS. Can del deliver up to 65 watts of power to a laptop coming in October for $250. Allison, I know you're a fan of a USB monitor, so you might want to take a look. Yeah, I was looking at that. The price is pretty good for 24 inches. Uh, 250 bucks is, is around what you get for the 15 inches, but it's only 1920 by 1080p, so it's 1080p. Mm -hmm. That's a really mm -hmm. low resolution for a monitor that big, isn't it? I mean, it depends on how good your eyes are. 
Yeah, I guess. Ever since I had cataract surgery, man, I can see everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also the Chromebook X211. Uh, that's an 11-inch tablet with a magnetic detachable keyboard and kickstand. Uses Qualcomm Snapdragon 7C system on a chip. Also has two USB-C ports, a micro SD card reader, but no headphone jack. This one comes with a wireless pen in the box that attaches to the side with a magnet for recharging. First device that can use Google's cursive progressive web app. And the one catching everybody's attention, HP announced the Chrome Base IO, spelled A-I-O, a Chrome OS desktop with a 21.5 inch 1080p touchscreen that you can rotate between landscape and portrait mode. It also tilts back 20 degrees if you want. Uh, it's the rotating that seems to have everybody buzzing, though. Also has dual 5-watt speakers in the base, two USB-C, two USB-A ports, a headphone jack on this one, 5-megapixel camera for video conferencing, and they pack in a wireless mouse and keyboard in the box for you. Uh, both the Chromebook X2 and the Chromebase I.O. start this month at 600 bucks. So the the all in one, I think is actually a pretty amazing product. That's a 21.5 inch monitor, but it's uh, 2160 by 1440. So you got a higher resolution and a smaller monitor. That's gonna look that's gonna look really good. Being able to rotate it 90 degrees is definitely slick. And the headphone jack, but you know, taking it out of the Chromebook X211, courage, right, Tom? <laughs> courage. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, I mean, what better Chrome uh, OS device to watch your TikToks on than one that I you can rotate? There you go. I, I do have one question on, on the tablet. There isn't a separate tablet OS for Chromebooks, right? No, it's just Chrome OS. Yeah. Okay. And, so and Chrome OS supports touchscreen. My, my Chromebook, I, I can do touchscreen yeah. on even though it's a laptop. So, yeah. So that's kind of nice. You don't have to actually care. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry. The apps are the same, everything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of slick. All right, tell uh, us uh, what App Annie found. All right, the analysts at App Annie found that in 2020, TikTok, speaking of TikTok, was the most downloaded app globally, the only app in the top five not owned by Facebook. Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook Messenger rounded out the top five. Snapchat and Telegram each moved up a spot from 2019 to number six and seven, while Pinterest moved up two spots to get back into the top 10, and Twitter sank one spot to the 10th. China's like fell two spots from sixth to eighth, and Line fell out of the top 10 worldwide, though it moved to number one in Japan. Yeah, Line's really interesting. Uh, it's a Japanese company that's been really popular in Korea and getting more popular in Japan, also I think pretty popular in Thailand, uh, but just not keeping pace in the rest of the world is what this means to me. So it's staying popular in the places where it's popular, even improving in Japan, just not gaining any new users and new markets, whereas TikTok has conquered the world. I mean, we we keep joking like this is the end for Facebook, with this is the point where it all turned. But these are the kinds of signs of something slowly losing its momentum and losing its popularity when it gets outdone by the new cool platform. Yeah, so Line and TikTok are two totally different things. I mean, one is a video sharing app, sure. and one is more of a chat app that's integrated in with payments and things like that. That's It's a little different. In my experience with Line is it feels uh, culturally connected to, uh, you said Korean, uh, Koreans love it, and I haven't actually talked to anybody in that, but uh, our mutual friend Kaylee, when I talked to her, man, it's full of these crazy fun emoji and everything, way more than what culturally we would do in the United States. And I wonder whether that maybe is part of it. I don't know. You're not, you're not culturally emoji, Allison. You don't throw emojis not, in your telegram. I do, but not, not quite as flashy as that. But I have to say, man, TikTok is my happy place. I go there now when, when I've been doom scrolling in Twitter and I just need to wash it off me. I go watch a bunch of comedians, uh, you know, people lip syncing comedians and babies doing funny things. And I just love it. It's the yeah. best thing ever. Well, uh, I, I like it because it's where Gen X and Gen Z can can have their dialogue about boomers and millennials uh, in peace. Uh, that, anyway, uh, go check this out. It's, it's interesting to see the trends uh, from App Annie. Let's talk about Amazon letting third parties sell on its platforms. But if you had a problem with that seller's wares in the past, up until now, even currently, you got to go to the seller if you've got an issue. If your property was damaged by a, by, a, by a device you bought, uh, if you were injured by a device you bought, Amazon says you'll have to take that up with the seller. They, they sold you the product, they're liable, not us. And they're right, that's legally true. But Amazon just announced that starting September 1st, Amazon will take claims themselves. 
It will engage an independent insurance fraud expert to analyze the claims to make sure that they're valid. If the claim appears to be valid, Amazon will then work directly with the seller and the seller's insurance company on your behalf. If the seller abides by Amazon's policies, holds valid insurance, and the claim is less than $1,000, Amazon will just pay your claim on behalf of the seller. They want to make this easy. You get your money. The seller doesn't lose any money. Everybody goes home happy. If the seller rejects a claim that Amazon believes is valid, which could happen, Amazon's expert might go, yeah, that's a valid claim. The seller goes, wait, we don't think so. Amazon may still step in and handle the claim while the seller continues to defend their product against it. So Amazon will kind of go to bat for you. They might even pay you in advance. Uh, depends on the situation. This policy is going to do two things. One it will shield sellers from having to deal with frivolous claims. If you're a seller on the platform, you won't have to deal with every person who thinks they have a claim, even though maybe it's their fault or nothing bad happened or they're trying to defraud you. Uh, Amazon's gonna step in and say, we'll, we'll handle all this stuff for you. It also simplifies the process for you, the consumer, if you have a valid claim, because you know to just go to Amazon. You don't have to figure out the third party and how best to contact them and where are they in the world and all that. Amazon's gonna handle every case without you having to find the seller. Amazon will also offer sellers product liability insurance through the Amazon Insurance Accelerator. Brilliant way to monetize this whole process to be like, look, uh, you wanna uh, have valid insurance to take advantage of this program. Also, by the way, we'll sell you some valid insurance if you wanna take part in this program. Uh, Amazon says that this whole thing goes beyond its legal objection or obligations, although courts have ruled inconsistently on Amazon's liability for defective products sold through its marketplace. Some have said Amazon does have some liability. You may remember that last month, the US Consumer Product Safety Commission sued Amazon to get it to accept responsibility for recalling hazardous products sold through Amazon. Recalls aren't, aren't part of this, but it is an ongoing debate about how much responsibility Amazon has for something they allow someone else to sell on their, their system. Because remember, sometimes Amazon just hooks you up, the person ships it, you're just paying through Amazon. Sometimes Amazon actually stores the stuff in their warehouse. And that's where the Consumer Product Safety Commission was saying, yeah, but if you store it in your warehouse, you might need to be responsible for some recall efforts on it. Allison, what do you make of all this? Well, the first thing I wanted to clarify is this is not, uh, I got sent the wrong product or it broke. This is where it actually caused some sort of damage in some way, is that right? Yes, that's right. But we're not talking about returns. We're not talking about just getting a refund because you didn't like it or, or it showed up damaged and you're just trying to send it back. Amazon has a whole separate process for that. This is, a process that offers customer support in the rare case of a defective product that causes property damage or personal injury. So it either like, you know, uh, it broke my car or burned my arm, stuff like that. So it seems to me that this is a, a good idea of an investment on Amazon's part. It's definitely, I would think it's gonna cost them some money to, to manage this, but it seems like the reputational damage of problems can be far, far worse. And obviously having regulators step in is always annoying for them. But it, it, my understanding of this is it would help them to just smooth things with both sellers and buyers. They yeah. don't want the sellers leaving and they definitely don't want the buyers leaving. So if they can be, it's almost like they're the, um, oh shoot, what's it called when you don't go to court, you go to arbitration. Yeah, It's almost like they're the arbitrator in between and they'll just clean up the mess. I'm real curious to know how big is this problem? Is this huge? It's probably big in a year. dollar amounts, right? Yeah. Like if somebody's sure. house burns down or right. if somebody gets sent to the hospital or dies, uh, right. you're, you're talking about big dollar amounts. It probably isn't frequent would be yeah, my so guess. So high risk, low frequency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, that, that brings up a few other reasons Amazon might want to do this. Uh, if they can keep themselves out of court, right? If they're like, got to talk to the third party and the person's like, I can't get a hold of the third party. They're in Guangzhou, but I know where to get a hold of you, Amazon, and I'll sue you. Uh, and this this, this actually helps Amazon of probably cut down on some court costs, to be honest. Uh, it also helps them identify bad actors e easier if they're- Oh yeah, good point, know, good point. You know, so- Bad uh, actors of not, uh, of selling bad stuff and bad yeah. actors of people doing uh, frivolous suits. And I like that there's a thousand dollar limit on part of it too. So that's basically they've created small claims court. Yeah, they they they're getting rid of of a, a lot. You know, death by a thousand cuts by doing that. Saying, look, if it's less than a thousand dollars, that's a rounding error on the Amazon balance sheet. You know, great. They'll they'll 
it's not even a rounding error. They'll they'll take care of that. If it's above a thousand dollars, they do say they may still step in sometimes. It all depends. Mm -hmm. uh, folks, with all that money you're saving now. I'm just going to pretend that that makes sense. Uh, you would like a DTNS hat, maybe, or a hoodie, or a mask, or a mouse pad. We have all that and more at the Daily Tech News Show store. Uh, brand new merch in there, by the way, with the new Daily Tech News Show album art logo on it. Uh, we haven't sold those until now, so go check it out at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. As you may know, Allison's Nocilicast has an ever so slight Apple bias. And there's lots of Apple rumors and reports swirling around today. So we thought it'd be fun to sort through some of those with her. First up, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, he's not always right, but it feels like he's always right, has a few inside tips about the next iPhone. Uh, let's call it iPhone 13 for simplicity. A cinematic video feature will automatically blur backgrounds in video like portrait mode does, according to Gurman's sources. ProRes video recording, kind of like pro raw, but for video uh, will be helpful for editors and a filter feature will be able to apply styles to elements of a photo, not just the whole photo. You know, you want to put bunny ears on your cat? I don't know, something like that. Probably more sophisticated. German also reiterates previous reports that the next iPhone would have 120 Hertz refresh rate and a smaller display notch. Uh, iPhone rumors, Allison, what do you think? Well, I think it's uh, very bold if they do call it the 13, but uh, <laughs> portrait mode on videos, I think it's obviously likely to be a big seller because people love it and it does a great job in still photos. I'm a little curious to see how well that works because portrait mode can be really compelling on people, not so much for other shallow depth of field opportunities, you know, like flowers, it's, it's kind of dorky the way it does that. Um, Pro Raw is, and Pro Res uh, for video is interesting. Pro Raw is interesting in still photos for a very specific reason. Reason A lot of cameras take raw photos and you can actually buy uh, apps that'll take raw photos with the iPhone. What Pro Raw does is it, is it well, a non-Pro Raw photo comes into the editor very flat and dim. It doesn't look as good as the JPEG would have. So you have to do a lot of work just to get it back up to where the JPEG would be. With Apple's Pro Raw, they apply the changes that they would do to a normal JPEG, but then let you change the raw file from there. You can undo all those changes or tweak them from there. So if ProRes support for video works the same way, that could be a great improvement, I think, for video editors. You know, I think Roger had an opinion on this. Is that right, Roger? Uh, it doesn't look like he's uh, he's jumping in, but I know I know Roger does uh, work with a lot of video. Roger, do you have something to add? Well, so ProRes in the video editing space, specifically uh, 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 Final Final Cut Final Cut Pro, uh, is a step below what you would consider raw video. In other words, it's a it's a lossy compression uh, video format that's higher than you would normally get with you know a, a non. Uh, a non-editable video format like um, MPEG or 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 uh, AVI or uh, uh, DivX or anything like that. And the whole idea is that you make it as easy as possible to edit while at the same time keeping it within a uh, file constraint so you're not literally uh, saturating the uh, the bandwidth in your device in order to edit. So this could essentially allow what what uh, what um, uh, I'm sorry, Allison was alluding to in that it will allow prograde features for people want to edit without necessarily taxing out everything they need to do, while at the same time giving uh, the ability to to tweak a bunch of things that you want to tweak without, again, having to to go to a third party app or anything like that to, to tweak it. All right, I am gonna break a rule here. I usually don't talk about supply chain reports because they're less reliable than, than Mark Gurman reports, but, the elect says Samsung is preparing to produce OLED displays for a new line of MacBook Pros. Digitimes fanned the flames of rumors that Apple released 14 and 16 inch laptops with new chips, possibly mini LED displays have entered production and that a 16 or 17 inch MacBook Pro with OLED is expected in 2022. I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire. The fire is we're gonna get a new MacBook of some sort, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Well, Tom and I have been in sync in step for, I think, three generations in a row of our MacBook. So we're both chomping at the bit for a 14 or 16 inch. Um, the thing I would point people to uh, to understand why mini LED is important is a fantastic episode of a show called Know a Little More. You might have heard of the uh, the host is a guy named Tom Merritt, hmm. and he explained why mini LED, uh, what mini LED is, and learn why you might want to be excited about it. And that's how come I know anything about mini LED. Uh, you know what? I actually have to refer back to my own notes from that episode <laughs> quite often to be like, okay, what was the deal with the mini? Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah uh, so yeah, yeah I'm, glad, I'm glad that was helpful for you. Definitely. Uh, fine. Uh, and oh, can I have it now is what I'd like to say. <laughs> hurry yeah. up, hurry up, hurry up. Finally, something that is not a rumor, Parallels Desktop 17 will let Mac users run Windows 11 on your Mac. Uh, works on both Intel and M1-based Macs, though... As with all Parallels installs, if you're on an M1, you can only emulate ARM-based versions of Windows. And Parallels 17 is now a universal app and supports Mac OS Monterey. Yeah, so the thing that's interesting about the uh, ARM-based version of Windows 11 for me is, is that my understanding is that the apps need to be compiled to work under ARM. And what I can't find, and I looked all over the place before the show, is a list of so what apps are compiled to work on Windows on ARM? Windows 11 allows you to emulate Intel apps to run on ARM. So if you're running Windows 11 ARM version on Parallels on an M1, Windows 11 will emulate an <laughs> Intel oh. chip for that app to run in the ARM version of Windows on an emulated uh, Windows server within the virtual machine on your M1 Mac. Which is ARM-based. Which is ARM-based, correct. <laughs> and by the way, I think there's a no a little more episode about ARM. <laughs> about I learned ARM. everything I know about That's ARM. I, I do want to back us up real quick to the to the thing on the uh, back on the iPhone, possibly 13. The the uh, the question about 120 uh, hertz refresh rate. Ken Ray mentioned on Mac OS Ken today a survey by Cell Cell that said of people planning to buy the next iPhone. 22% cited the 120 hertz refresh rate as why. I find that hysterically, I, I find that comical. I, I, I'm, I believe I'll be able to tell the difference, but would I drop a thousand dollars for it? No, no. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's uh, feature inflation in your head, yeah, folks. Yeah. That, that's what it is. 120 hertz is beautiful. It's buttery smooth. After you've had it for a couple of days, yeah. probably going to get used to it. So I don't know. I, you know, what is funny though, uh, since you brought that up, I went from the iPhone 10 to the iPhone 12, right? Ooh, nice jump. Yeah, it was a big jump, but it didn't feel like I made much of a jump. Oh, wow. It's a, it's a snappier processor, certainly slightly bigger screen, but it works the same way. And yeah. yet, even though I went all the, you know, three years between those two phones, I kind of want the next iPhone anyway, and I don't know why. Maybe it's subconsciously the 120 hertz. I don't know. All right, uh, let's finish up with a robot dog. Xiaomi announced the CyberDog, an open source quadruped robot meant for developers to build on. CyberDog has NVIDIA's Jetson Xavier NX AI supercomputer inside, 11 touch and ultrasonic sensors, some cameras, and GPS that all help it interact with its environment. It can follow its user, navigate around obstacles on its own, and identify posture and track faces. If you're like, hey, I need you to follow Allison in that crowd, supposedly it'll have a good chance of being able to do that. Xiaomi will release 1,000 cyber dogs into the wild. No, that's not, they're gonna release the 1,000 cyber dogs to engineers and robotics enthusiasts, uh, facilitated by a Xiaomi-created open source community. Uh, if you are approved to buy one, uh, it'll cost you 9,999 yuan. That's around $1,540 uh, US. The company also said it might build a robotics laboratory for future innovations. But uh, if you're following the Boston Dynamics story, you'll look at this and go like, oh, it's kind of like Spot. Uh, but that's a big step up for Xiaomi. Yeah, and, and having it be an open source project like the like they're going to do where they're going to put it out to developers. I mean, this is made for the DTNS audience, right? Oh, Come on, Nerdballs, yeah. let's get some. And, yeah. and then send us pictures, show us what you did with it. Yeah, if one of you can afford it and get accepted to be uh, one of the people that gets one of these, uh, definitely let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, we want to we see some pics. Pics or it did happen. I, I do like the idea, Allison, that this indicates that 
robot dogs, dog shaped robots, let's say, because they're not really dogs. Uh, they're not like Ibo. Dog shaped robots are now commonplace. Yeah, they're you don't commodity. even flinch, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, another company is doing these now. Um, will will we be in a world where little four legged robots are just kind of prancing around in public spaces sometimes? And will they be able to dance? That's well, yeah, really the they, question. And they don't need permission to dance. Well, they they'll want just, to dance. They'll just dance. They can dance if they want to. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. What do we got, Allison? All right, let's do it. Scott weighed in about our Is the Apple TV Pointless conversation from yesterday. He wrote, yes, I'm in the ecosystem, but the kids play Crossy Road Castle on it, and all four can play together at once. Apple needs more games like that to, to be in a better position or to better position it as a PlayStation Xbox alternative. I maintain that this is part of their long-term plan. That's something you didn't mention, but we also use it for Fitness Plus, AirPlay, and all the other reasons you did mention because we're in the ecosystem. Versatility is a big piece of it if I had to sum it up in one word. There's really nothing I want to do on it that I can't. And Jay wrote, the only reason I could justify the price tag on Apple TV was privacy and security. I guess that's two. <laughs> the first thing I did when I got my brand new Vizio TV was update the firmware and disable Wi-Fi. I use Apple TV exclusively for streaming. I feel like the smart TV apps don't get updated often enough and all the streaming sticks out there, including Roku, are subsidized by advertising. Uh, yes, 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 what Jay said. You know, to, to Scott's point about the games, the reason we didn't mention it is apparently you are the only three people using it. Like they, it's very low usage on the gaming side. And so people don't consider it to be a deciding factor. Now, maybe that'll change. Maybe, Scott, you're just on the leading edge and it's, and it's going to rise. But Jay, I think you're right, Allison, is one of those people who who is representing a lot of other people's feelings on this, that, you know, this is the only one that isn't collecting data on me. Yeah, I'm I'm right with Jay. I was yelling at my, uh, at my iPad yesterday when you were talking about it. We turned on our new Sony TV, updated the firmware, disabled Wi-Fi, and never looked back. Uh, Brian weighed in as well. Uh, Brian also, uh, you know, said, yeah, the not tracking, not collecting data, not advertising, uh, that's important to me as well. He also said, I switched to iPhone last year, got the Apple TV for AirPlay, and I loved the interface without ads, but also I noticed a huge improvement in sound quality over both the Roku and the Android TV. I have a mid-range receiver and a good set of 5.1 speakers, and I'm not sure how the ones and zeros from the streaming services get manipulated in the different streaming boxes, but the surround sound was definitely definitely improved through the Apple TV. I also now love the lossless and spatial audio in Apple Music through the Apple TV as well. I I that's as I said yesterday, that's the one I think is going to be one that Apple's going to push is like superior quality, better picture, better sound, better integration into your home somehow. That that's where I bet Apple starts doubling down. Uh that and the privacy. I I I think I think you're right about the privacy. You know, they need to find that uh, 120 hertz refresh rate lingo to put on it somewhere so people will want it, right? Yes, buttery smooth. Uh, well, they can do more than 120 in an Apple TV, right? There they you just go. blow everybody's mind. Keep those emails coming, folks. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, we, we've got all kinds of good emails in there that we haven't even got to. Uh, so if you haven't heard yours read on the show, don't worry. We read it, and it may still yet be read. Thanks to our brand new boss. We got a new boss, Rob Woo! Weatherly. Just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Rob Weatherly. Folks, it's uh, it, it's not a lot. We seriously appreciate new patrons. Uh, patrons, young and old, but really gives us a jolt when somebody finally makes that moment to go like, you know what? I've been enjoying this for free for long enough. Uh, I don't want to hear the ads anymore. Let me become a Patreon and, and, and get it that way. So thank you, Rob Weatherly. And uh, thank you, Allison Sheridan, for, for joining us today. You've got some cool stuff going on. Tell some folks about it. The coolest thing I did in the last week was on my show, Chit Chat Across the Pond Light. My guest was DTNS science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. I had her on to talk in depth about the work that she does and uh, with headbutting uh, animals and studying micro concussions. And she gets into dissecting things and, and the imaging that she does. And it was, it was not only technically really interesting, it was delightful. She is funny. She's brilliant. I could not have had more fun. It was absolutely fantastic. Definitely look for Chit Chat Across the Pond Light with Dr. Nikki Ackermans. 
Ah, uh, that's great. Yes, if you're enjoying the Sunday Science uh, Supplement on the Daily Tech Headlines feed, uh, find out a little more about the the voice behind it uh, at Chit Chat Across the Font Pond, podfeet.com. We are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>